Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. You know, excited to not be outside painting a mural today. Yeah. <laughs> Is it still really warm there? It's actually a little bit like fall-ish the last couple of days. It's been kind of nice, actually. Yeah. Um, but oh. the last week was insanely hot. Like, just so, so, so yeah. hot. Three days last week, Chrissy was out painting that a mural in Peterborough. And, like, there's no, there's no cover. It's in an alleyway. It's hot. Yeah. It felt bad for <laughs> But yes. Oh, dear. Yesterday, we went back to finish up the mural by installing these, like, wood panels. So, like, that was a really long day. Yeah, but it wasn't that bad outside, no. so that was nice. Happy for the fall weather. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so happy to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we're excited. <laughs> I, like, um, did, like, sort of a brief explanation of um, our, like, transition right now for the Emerging Artists Award in our post, um, and just, just to like recap on what that is before we like launch into, uh, flat files today, Kyle and I for like, basically like since we started Sparkbox, um, wanted to make sure that we were like giving back to at that time, like our peers, cause we had just graduated from school and, uh, I feel like we can't say that anymore cause we're like long past that experience now, but, but... I still feel like an emerging. Yeah. <laughs> I feel I like I relate to that crew very much so, but yeah, we, we sort of noticed that like, it, even though there, I think there's this illusion that there's tons and tons of opportunities for emerging artists and a lot fewer opportunities for established artists. And we've definitely got a lot of emails about how a lot of people perceive that to be the fact when we were actually like leaving school, we, we didn't really see a lot of opportunities yeah. for people that, you know, didn't have work outside of their undergrad. Um, and most of their exhibitions related to work from their undergrad. There was a lot of like stipulations that you couldn't show student work in an application for certain funding or certain um, opportunities. And we were kind of like, one that we got really upset about was you can't apply for this unless you've been out of school for X number of years. Mm -hmm. oh. And yeah. So we were like, this doesn't seem like that advantageous for like artists actually getting a career started outside of school. So we wanted to create something to sort of help with that. And that was where our emerging artists award kind of originated and yeah. it's grown and shifted over the years. And then we developed more awards, but it's something that we've kept doing and that we want to keep doing. And it's been obviously a little bit of a challenge right now, considering we aren't having people come and live in the house with us. So Josephine was one of our award winners from 2020. Last so got selected in 2019. So it's been kind of a long time. Uh, and you've been so like patient and lovely and wonderful. All of you have been the award winners from that year. Um, and just like kindly um, tolerating our not knowing what we're doing for the past like year and a half. And we kind of came up with a plan to at least acknowledge and, you know, work with those award winners from that year, this year through some form of a virtual experience and then an exhibition which we kindly got um, partially funded by uh, a local community futures organization here. So as part of that project, we're gonna have each of our award winners over the next couple of months join us uh, here on Flat Files to get a bit of a studio tour, talk about the work that they're doing, hopefully talk a little bit about the work that we're gonna be exhibiting at the gallery in October. And yeah, just get like a chance to like share your work and um, kind of, you know, virtually have you here at Sparkbox. So thank you for making time and um, participating in this. Yeah, thank you so much for um, being so, like the correspondence has just been kind of amazing. And um, you're, I mean, I think it was so precarious and unknown for so many of us that I was like, well, I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> it's a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> what are we gonna do uh, so like I, I yeah i didn't worry at all about you know like how long it would take or what it would happen i was just um happy to just have that sort of connection um 
and just see where where it went. And I'm so glad that I get to be a part of this um, emerging artist exhibition in October. And then um, I'm really excited also to meet the other um, uh, exhibiting artists. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> you're a great crew. I think you're gonna really enjoy each other, and yeah. I think you're all gonna really like love each other's work. So that's also something I'm very excited about. Uh, as part of our tradition of flat files, we usually just pass it right over to our guests and have you introduce yourself and then um, start chatting about your practice. And then we kind of just have like a very informal conversation with each other. Okay. Um, so hello, and I'm Josephine. <laughs> and um, my work really deals a lot with ideas of uh, how we understand our our home and our place of um, our relationship to where we are um, in relationship to our cultural sort of heritage. And so ideas of like how as a person who has grown up who has, was born somewhere else and has ties to another country and lives um, currently uh, in like a, a, a in North America primarily for myself. Um, what that what that uh, cultural and, and the societal navigation has been like and questions like that I think are um, a couple. They have these like different tiers for me and some of it is is very personal and and very like domestic. But also all of that seems to constantly draw me towards questions about um, uh, like how the nation state operates and what ideologies it places upon ourselves and what belief systems we adopt and what sort of um, assumptions that we hold in, in, in our ideas of home and belonging and ideas of citizenship or nationality or nationalism. And so I think all my past works have been sort of gearing and, and kind of working in that in that strain. And then lately, I've been um, kind of implicating uh, technological transformations into that mixture. And so thinking about how um, various industries, whether it's militarization or like surveillance is a huge one these days, or drone um, uh, yes, surveillance and, and drone strikes, and but also like, uh, you know, um, mass incarceration and um, uh, bioengineering or agricultural, you know, um, genetic modification, all of these things, every sort of facet in our lives and our industry seem to tie themselves sort of relationally back into this giant sort of um, amorphous network of technology. And so how does technology inform and, and kind of uh, implicate us into this system of our understanding of who we are and then also how can we as as artists um, and as um, as BIPOC folks actually transform it into the future that we want to see and so um, right now I am in this very lovely bigger than I've ever had <laughs> studio uh, residency at the Griffin uh, Art Projects in North Vancouver and um, I'm working on uh, using biomaterials. So um, very like DIY in your home kitchen type of bioplastics, bio leathers, bio concrete, ceramic, stuff like that, that you can make um, on your own and that don't require an industrial heat source to then re-recycle, -re um, so, which means you can just kind of like toss it back into your compost bin. And so uh, adding that level of kind of consciousness and sustainability and those questions surrounding and in, um, problematics of sustainability um, within this project that looks into creating like poetical armatures for um, uh, BIPOC people and then performing acts of not violence, but care and resilience with these sort of armatures. And so um, that uh, came about, um, and maybe that's just a little bit of background that I can give is, um, so in the industry um, for ballistics and military body armor, the plate, like the bulletproof plate that's usually inserted is uh, uh, termed the trauma plates, which I think is, is, is deeply ironic and, and, and troublesome because of the trauma that is inflicted by the nation state onto our bodies. Um, and they themselves are kind of called trauma plates. And so I, I take that, I took that and then I, I recognize that also like the material qualities of those plates, sometimes they're um, made of like uh, some kind of polymer or some metal or, or some type of composite um, and layers. And sometimes they're also made of ceramics. And so I started playing around with um, 
with uh, porcelain and doing some like tests with that and i can show you yeah yes please okay, wait. i love uh, this about your work because it's so um cross-disciplinary like when we were i was like re-looking at your application again because it's been a while obviously um and just like the materials that you work with and the way you explore ideas i really like how it's sort of like idea first and the materials just match what you want to like the best way to get to that place. Um, but I also am kind of like, how are you like, I don't know, like how are you like constantly learning how to deal with all these different materials? Um, I mean, I, that's a really good question. I, I think the, um, the answer is that like, because I'm not a, a ceramicist or a physicist <laughs> or a scientist, um, I can get away with not knowing um, what I'm doing. <laughs> So I can be like, oh yeah, this this thing and the plasma and the and the and the ceramics, but you know, like anyone in the actual industry would just kind of look at it and go, well, well, like this person is clearly like using it as a poetical exercise and not as a way to actually make it any functional, accurate, proper way of doing it in the industry. And I think that's the that's sort of the joy of being an artist is that you can kind of um, kind of take. Um, as as like conscious as, as possible but like kind of gather all of these uh, sources and then and create something that you that makes sense to you and my brain sort of um like is very like fragmented and i get distracted a lot and go ooh, like ooh, that, another shiny thing and so that <laughs> works really well for me <laughs> i can relate to that <laughs> um, but i'll show you this massive space which i have trouble filling right now but um it's quite oh big my gosh. I know, and I, I feel, I feel, I feel very grateful, and also like wow. kind of daunted. Um, but so here's the first table, and I'll show you. So I started making some um, tests. So one of the ways that um, armor was made in the past was using these kind of like tiles, and so I tried tiling it, and then. Um, placing um, and then glazing them and then kind of seeing how they would uh, form themselves into a plate. And then I did like, let a, like I tried like a shoulder. Um, and then I tried, these are, these are like arm guards, um, like forearm guards that I would sort of slip into um, cloth. Um, and then I tried, I tried that um, with stoneware porcelain, but it sort of seemed to mimic what was already existing and i and I, it didn't seem to go any further than that so i was like okay well let's see what i can do with um with just like uh, a sculpey let's just try, try kind of making some of these cutouts so these are um based on these are cutouts based on the rifle plate cutouts in the industry and so there's this one and they've kind of warped a bit you can oh, see on the okay. screen i don't um, think i know what a rifle plate is like i don't know what that i don't yeah. know yeah it well it's just like a it's way that they uh term different ways of cutting into these uh trauma plates that they would insert into their into their armor and it would depend on uh your like what you're doing in in the armed forces right so oh, sometimes okay. you need like a deeper cut maybe because you know you're, you're this is called like a shooter cut so maybe this is like somebody who has like more of like a like a need to kind of have like a deeper sort of flexibility or maybe um, this one, I can't remember what it was called, but um, so it's, it's dependent on, on like the type of, I guess, job, job. that you do. Yeah. Um, and and like, so this I guess mobility needs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you. <laughs> mobility. Um, <laughs> and then, um, so then, these are the biomaterials that I've been making. So this is just um, glycerin and um, gelatin in like a ratio and it's quite thin and it's like plastic, but you can literally just throw this in the compost and then it will just decompose. And then here is like my little shelf of sand experiments. So on the top shelves, I have these different tests I made with biomaterials. And then on the bottom shelf, um, all these sort of ingredients that are very readily available in your grocery store or just like your, your soap dispensary store, I suppose. Um, this is a leather, fish leather that I tanned. You just take like uh, any fish skin from, you know, what you eat. And then you, um, I use tea to tan it. Oh, and then, 
you soften it and it becomes this wonderful, you know, very tough and usable leather. And it smells wonderful too. It doesn't smell I fishy at all. No idea you could do that. That, mm -hmm. is, that is so fascinating. Cool. This is rad. I really enjoy your exploration of materials. It seems that like as you explore them, you let them kind of talk back to you and inform where you are going to go with it. And it's not necessarily like you have like an end goal with like working with these armor plates. You were just kind of curious and now you're like developing kind of some stuff. So like what's kind of the next steps for you with like, you've like making like these bio, by the way, these like bio materials are really cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so that's a good question. So, the um, do you want me to show you the rest of it, or, or I can talk about yeah, like yes. the next thing that I'm yeah, doing? Yeah. Oh. All right. Um, so, this is, Sorry, this is a, isomalt. So, isomalt is like a, a lower heat melting uh, sugar that they use in like uh, in restaurants and pastry, like in the baking industry. Yeah. And basically, it just comes in these powder forms, and you can blow it into sugar, like sugar glass, like as if you were blowing glass or um you can i try to making like some more like dimensional forms out of them this is coffee leather which is um alginate and co use coffee grounds what? It's, kind of like it's leather which is kind of neat wait tell me how do you make coffee leather so you take sodium alginate and then you um, you blended it with water and a little bit of olive oil and um, glycerin and just use coffee grounds and you get leather. So where where are you finding this information? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the the wonderful thing about the biomaterials um, community is that everybody wants to try to find like another source that's sus like sustainable packaging, sustainable materials, and so there's like everything is open source online, and so it was just me spending months and months going through all these recipes, testing it out, watching things like melt and partially explode. Um, and then just going back and like refining and like fine tuning the recipes that I would like to test further. And then that's just kind of been my, my process so far. Um, but everything is, is quite online. And if anybody is interested in like a free workshop, then I'm happy to also do that at some point in the future. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, okay. okay, so so let's uh, continuing. Um, this one is um, activated charcoal, and um, it has degrees of flexibility, but essentially it's conductive, and so you can make like a, a conductive fabric with it, um, which is pretty pretty rad. And then these are similar, like this is um, sodium alginate, like the coffee ground leather, but without any coffee grounds. These are a little more flexible, and this is just glycerin and gelatin. How, um, what do these feel like? Does this feel, feel like... A... Like, almost like vinyl plastic. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is, is it, like, kind of, like, squishy? Like, like a kid's toy? Or is it, like, kind of... Rid like is... No, it, it feels like, um, like, just like a flat piece of plastic. Like a poly plastic. And did um, you dye this? Yeah, I just put some um, beet uh, powder into it to see what the color oh, would be like. It looks um, really good. I like the beet powder actually. Yeah. Oh, this is um, like uh, this. This is this recipe, um, except yeah, I just use dried nettle leaves. And oh wow, into a great I think rigid it, flexible thing. The um, I like the idea of sort of the plant matter in with this uh, project. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I tried using um, this is calendula flowers, dried petals and just in there. And the great thing is that the more you add the you can kind of create like a stronger fabric or material like on its own, maybe it's somewhat strong, but like with some additives, it becomes like very flexible, you know, you have more, more that you can do with it. Um, this is kombucha leather. Um, oh. And so you just, um, kombucha scoby is great because it'll just form um, like a sheet um, surface over whatever surf, um, container you put it in. So if you put it in a bottle, it'll become like that. If you put it in a bathtub, <laughs> it'll become the size of the bathtub over time Ooh. on the surface. And then you wait until it's like about 
one like a half inch to I, I waited till like it was like an inch thick and then it dries into something quite thin um but uh like flexible and like leather and leather like whoa mm. i also didn't know mm. that at all so with this once it's in the dried form if you rehydrate it yeah will it reform back like what what's the like next phase of that like if it if it's uh, like um exposed to moisture right so so that's the um i guess benefit slash drawback is that because it is compostable like any like long-term humidity or or water source will probably just kind of like disintegrate it um, and go back into into the world um as it were and then this is like my cooking station um and lab <laughs> and so i just cook up all the things and i measure it in this um on the scale and then i just uh try different sort of um recipes of of these materials under here and so i've got some like oxides and colors and um some calendula flowers and, and chamomile and hibiscus oh. and then gelatin powder and glycerin and all these things are really just kind of like quite easy to source and i i wanted to find something that was like affordable and useful and not not hard and not like um, that you can find locally as well. So, yeah. Have you have you tried to like take these and sew things with them? Like actually, like use the leather to make something. What happens? Yeah. So so you can, um, and it works quite well. But I found that I I still haven't gotten that like perfect um, rigidity slash flexibility that I want. And so that's kind of like the next. That's yeah. That's kind of one of the next steps. And then it's moving a little bit away from the actual like. Uh, body armor to like a face shield and so the the that's kind of what I'm doing now is um uh I started uh looking into so so one part of it is uh, ballistic gel and so ballistic gel is like this um you just make it with, there's like a recipe for it online as well but in the industry you, you you can make these blocks of ballistic gel and then they would fire bullets into it and kind of be able to see like I feel like the, I've seen this on Mythbusters or something yeah you most definitely have <laughs> totally yeah so you could and then it like tracks like the the amount of like force and energy and like the 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 way that the bullet um would hit your target and so i found that something um really interesting about that gel is that the recipe for that ballistic gel is the same as a recipe for a skincare mask what yeah, so there's like this whole recipe for a skincare mask um, that is, that uses glycerin, uh, like that uses glycerin and gelatin. That is like, if not identical, like the the ratio is a little bit different, but the ingredients are the same. And so I started. Um, so, uh, this is how big this studio is. She had to roll her <laughs> away from us. <laughs> <laughs> this is never gonna happen again <laughs> so i'm very I'm very glad to I could share this with someone even virtually um so as um as somebody who has um participated in a lot of like korean rituals of like skin beautification one of the things that i've been constantly given my whole life is like these skin like these face masks yeah um and so I kind of recreated one out of like a vellum, just kind of, this is sort of like the template that usually these like cloth masks should come in. And yeah. then they would be saturated, um, if not made entirely out of this like uh, material, this uh, gelatin uh, uh, material. And so I try, I'm trying to kind of, um, I, this is one other iteration using um, uh, just like Sculpey clay air dry oh, okay. clay yeah. um and so right now i'm making these uh uh this line of skincare using um ballistic gel and uh creating this like kind of uh interesting i guess like contradiction and complexity with um w what is it to like protect your face but also what are like the the politics behind like that like idea of of like um what whitening your face or skincare or like itself um and like the gendered role of that alongside like the the way that um the ballistic gel itself captures like the 
ch- captures a trace of violence mm-hmm. on your on 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 in itself and so creating like kind of very ridiculously like thick um skin skin masks or kind of distorting them somehow and then that's sort of what my next sort of series and product line <laughs> is going to be as i launch a whole line of like i don't know rihanna like like skin skin products <laughs> for the for the bipoc artist who wants to you know show show themselves care um and then also resilience and kind of trace this to, to try to trick trace this violence that's happening to us mm-hmm. yeah. i'm excited to hear what you call it i think that it's interesting to like that through all this research and discovery you are like seeing this like relationship between materials and it's and their different usages and how I the I was looking at the piece that you did I think it was last year I'm pretty sure it's at 2020 um uh, about the nuclear bomb sites and mm-hmm. even with that you were sort of like tying like those beautiful um I think it was was it a glassware or was it a ceramic piece the um the ceramic, moon the jars moon Yeah. Um like tying this like very um culturally specific but also kind of domestic piece that you associate with something radically different but that you might associate with home to these homes that were being used to explore just such a terror um that I think we all like even if we don't think about it very often are like aware is just like out there in the universe um and constantly mm-hmm. like i i mean i think during the trump time i felt even more like it was like an impressive threat on my brain uh even though i you know i didn't live through the cold war so i don't know what it's actually like to feel that in a real scary way but it was sort of just this thing that i was aware of and we actually just did a project where one of the um uh co-artists in the group show was talking about nuclear waste and you talk a little mm-hmm. bit about like the idea of like clean up and vessels that are holding um mm-hmm. waste you know in a different way he was looking at like nuclear sites that are being used for energy um but again it's this idea of like just materials can have such um opposing sources and uses uh which i think is really fascinating about like what you're doing right now with these pieces yeah i think that's the that's where i i get most excited is like seeing these parallels happening in different industries and what yeah. that what what that really means or or what it can mean and it kind of reopens our eyes into thinking that that's not it's not we're not siloed into these different parts and partitions right like all of us are sort of implicated but also embedded in multiple different stratas and and networks and systems and so to see those parallels and to sort of like kind of create these like sort of um a little bit like a tongue in cheek but also like a little bit like humorous but also like serious uh connections to them creates a different sort of understanding of where we are. Yeah. Is does this link back at all to the work that you were going to do while here with the seaweed? Cuz at that time you were proposing a seaweed piece. I I'm pretty sh- sure it was seaweed. Oh, yeah, yeah. I I think it <laughs> I think it's different, but now that you mention it, I could put seaweed into this line as well as we're uh, talking about skincare. <laughs> yeah, seaweed. exactly. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you for that <laughs> reminder. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, can we talk a little bit about the pieces that we're going to have um here for the exhibition? Sure. Um I I unfortunately I can't show you them because they're they're currently in, in, not here with me, but um yeah. the they're basically an ongoing series that have been hand sewing um out of um organza silk which is a, a very similar if not like um common silk that's used um in korean like fabrics and in um traditional costumes and so that uh so i've been cutting out different poetic uh and 
kind of lines of protest and poetry and um, and observation that I've like written out, and then I would cut out, hand cut out all these letters in a particular color of silk, and then place them back onto the same color and fabric to create like a slightly darker like layer for the for the letters and then hand sew them in this um, traditional sort of embroidery technique which is almost like it looks like three ellipses and a line and so it creates this strange like language of itself over the over the letters and so um, those are kind of like loosely kind of sewn onto these very large I would say maybe like 10 foot by four feet uh, long sort of um, uh, flags or, or banners and then um, I have like a series of those that are then coming to to Sparkbox and I'm really excited to see what they would look like um, yeah because they're because they're so long um, sometimes they end up like the ends sort of end up trailing on the ground but I, I would imagine that it would it would look interesting either way like that way or something that's kind of like more like floating or has space to float um, yeah. yeah, I think they're going to be really perfect for the the space because yeah. it's all windows. And I, I'm pretty sure the space they're in right now it also is in a, like a window type space, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't sure in the images that you sent if it's like casting a shadow or if that was just the way that it was photographed. Uh, like the flags themselves cast a shadow? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how much they do because they're fairly transparent. Maybe that was just like the the quality of being shot like in broad like very peak sunlight. Maybe. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it looks really beautiful. I like the idea too of again just like the way that you work with materials and the choices that you're making. The like a protest sign is usually, you know, I've been to several protests. They're usually like you know, not so meticulously created. They're usually like pretty like Sharpie on cardboard or <laughs> Bristol board. Mm. Um, you know, they're very loud because they need to be loud. Um, and so I, I love this like callback to sort of, cause the text that you're using does have a very like protest feel. They're very like pared down. So it's just the message. There's not really anything else distracting you from what's being said, but the softness mm -hmm. of the material, um, outside of it being like used in sort of like traditional um like korean dress was there another reason why like you wanted to take this message and make it in a textile as opposed to um like a more traditional sign material yeah i i for me i thought there was something really it, it, it I don't know. I th thought there was something really interesting in the like the hard message on a soft medium, and so there's like this hardness but softness, and it's almost like uh, someone someone had like this shirt once, and it said radical softness, and I think I I kind of <laughs> love. Was that you? Is that? Mad? Is that oh. uh, I think it might be a friend of ours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, th I thought that was great and I was I was thought you know like that that's something what what I what I was kind of um thinking about um w when I was uh kind of figuring out where I wanted it to go that that someone would be encountering something very like um light and and kind of um soft and then they would encounter the the lettering and kind of be confronted by this like almost like a double take and a, and a jarring um sensation because it's it's confronting the viewer to kind of um uh question like and, and kind of un unpack like the 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 material but also the the violence that comes with like m immigrant labor and then life and history and so i wanted that position definitely i'm so glad you picked that up yay <laughs> i'm so excited i think they're going to be beautiful and i just like yeah i just feel very like honored to be able to like be putting this show together and have a space to show the work and uh it's something that we've wanted to do for so many years uh but we've never afforded ourselves the space to buy rent and yeah. um <laughs> well we didn't buy the gallery but to rent a space where we can exhibit things so um yeah i'm, I'm just really thrilled that this will be like yeah. the first year that we are doing that and i think the like work that each of you will be presenting is just going to be such a like gorgeous and um, yeah, like just such a nice show to be having in our community. I can't wait. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Do you feel like, and you don't have to answer this, but do you feel like this past year has changed the way that you are working or has impacted what you want to be working on? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I think uh, for a while there, I didn't know where I was going to live, let alone like make work in. And then um, I think that really sort of um, placed me in like a like a narrower field of just sort of like reading and researching and taking notes and doing all these things. And then I think that that really actually, um, to some extent, uh, shifted m my focus on I think at first I was always like on the bandwagon of, oh, like there's this incredible um, new like thing that's um, whether it's like a like a software or an object or material. And I want to test it. I want to see what it's like and I want to like handle it and see if it's useful or not. Um, but the but the sort of downside of that um was that I had always ended up like having no money and <laughs> being super in debt. <laughs> and so like the, the fact that I couldn't do those things um, and also that I was kind of um, restricting myself um, consciously to not do that um, was a kind of a great reminder that I, I can continue to keep my, my ideas in the forefront and then my concept in the forefront. And it's okay to do like, like test, like, you know, on paper is fine, Josephine, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think that that has has really helped and and made me like a more um like maybe able to also like sustain uh, like personally and like mentally and um has has benefited my work i think yeah and like i don't know if you like a lot of people we've talked to in the past year have been sort of like restricted in the space that they have to use i mean now not so much uh, you have a load of space to work with right now but um prior to this space were you also kind of like working from home and trying to like make the best of like because you're in vancouver it's not like a super affordable place to live um <laughs> Or a place that I, I don't know many people that are my friends that live in Vancouver and have a lot of space to use. Um, yeah, for sure. I think housing um, space is like a huge, huge issue. Um, and coming back from my master's in New York, like I, I, I just I was kind of couch surfing for a while at friends' houses um, and I didn't have a studio and I didn't have a studio until until now. This is um, the, like this residency is only for two months. And then at the end of September, I kind of have to move on. Um, so like I'm just enjoying it, like lying down on the ground, <laughs> taking a whole space. Um, but before that, I I was kind of going stir crazy because I I needed to make things and I and I just couldn't in my you know one bedroom apartment with my partner. And so um, I uh, had like a little bit of a stipend from graduating, and they had like provided like me with a small award, and it was in U.S. dollars. And I was like, oh okay, let's let's put this in the bank and save it. And I was like, no, I'm gonna <laughs> use it. For my work and so uh on craigslist i found uh somebody um in vancouver that was selling just like uh their um their like little shed in the backyard and it was like two hundred dollars and i was like oh i can like that's possible and so i um solicited my friends to come with me and we just tore the thing apart and then reconstructed it um, like a ramshackle, like slightly not up to code <laughs> shit. Um, in on the on like a, we had like a concrete patio surface um, on our in our rental, and it's it's kind of in a it's like a basement suite, so it's in a in a very low sort of um, it, like innocuous sort of space that nobody really goes to, and it's terrible to put anything in, and um, and so it's always been empty. And then so we just put this like little squishy like six by six you know, cabin in there, a little shed in there. And then I just uh, ripped the roof off of it and placed like, you know, that corrugated plastic. Yeah. Um, and it's been, it's been amazing when it, uh, the temperature is, is like ideal, which is two days out of the year. <laughs> then, <laughs> the time I'm like sweating because <laughs> it's so hot because it's a greenhouse. And then um, just like I have to like go in with a space heater and warm it up and have like hot tea and, and like blankets and and it's so cold and, and um, in there. But it's it's wonderful. I, and I, I can't complain because it's space. So, oh, my gosh, that's so resourceful. <laughs> I love that story.
That's, I, I, yeah, I feel like figuring out how to make something work has been like a big component of like this show we've been doing is like just seeing how resourceful artists are mm -hmm. and how, I don't know, maybe how willing we are to tolerate a super hot or super cold space in order to have space, which yeah. like, I don't know. I, I feel like it's a little bit telling of like, how dedicated and impassioned we are by what we want to be doing. And yeah, that's so smart. I love that you did that. That's so awesome. But I'm also happy that you have this giant space right now. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I have temperature control. There's a thermometer on the wall. <laughs> Insulation in the in the in the wall is just it's it's bananas. I've never experienced such luxury. Oh my <laughs> <That's> gosh! <amazing. laughs> um, so we have like art share time. Yeah, a couple little. Well, we have exactly two art shares today, and I know that you're gonna more or less just like talk about people, and then I'm gonna share uh, images and links to them um, on our stories afterwards, which I think is totally fine. So let's go for it. Um, do you want us to start or do you want to start with the art chair? Please. No, I would love to hear um, who you want to talk about. Okay. Our first art share yeah, let's see. <laughs> is, sorry, they're really text heavy. I'll, I'll read one of them. Do you want Here, to Here, I'll read, wait, what's this one? Uh, is this the one that I want to read? No, where's the one that I want to read? This one. Okay, so the first little art share is a collection of tiny zines. Um, and they're by the late artist Lisa Visser. So Lisa went to Queens where we went to school. Um, and she unfortunately passed away in 2013. <laughs> But uh, Lisa's work I thought you might like because she also was like really interested in sort of like um, this like place of tenderness in humanity and like um, this like interest in like tr like searching for the kindness and building relationships. Sometimes she would talk about relationships with animals like this idea of like building a kind and like beautiful relationship with like a cat. Um, but she also was very political and she was a feminist and uh, her work just like, she had a lot of like love and meaning and um, heart put into it. So I thought you might really like her work. And this little collection of zines um, is, I think they're called Cat and Bird. Yes, Cat and Bird. And there was, I think, a hundred zines. We don't have all a hundred. Sure. I'll, I'm going to read this one, but you can just show the insides of some of the other ones. And it basically, it's this, they were, there were collages and then these zines. And it was like a, a sort of um, shitty friendship between this cat and bird. But they <laughs> always um, would like forgive each other. <laughs> and tr I don't know, try to make the best of like maybe a friendship that wasn't super good. So I'm going to read um, issue 40 Parents. from April 15th. I'm back in the city. We, if you want to come up here and read it from this way. I'm just going to read it this way because it's <laughs> easier. So this one's called When is Good? Um, so the little cat says, I'm back in the city. Let's hang out. And the little bird says, oh, I'd love to. And the little kid says, great. I'm not that busy, are you? This is what the pictures look like. They're like, just like simple little drawings. So she did one of these every day. Uh, then the bird says, well, a bit, but I would like to make time for you when is good. And the cat says, well, in the next few days, I have a class and a series of other plans. And the little bird's just standing there kind of looking like miffed by that. And then the little bird says, uh, but I have work and various other obligations. And the little cat says, can you make time for me? And the little bird says, can you make time for me? And then the little bird also says, you're always the one who's leaving. I've been right here the whole time. And then he says, and now I'm busy. Um, I don't know. I feel like I can really relate to this. <laughs> uh, especially because I feel like um, something that I 
I personally struggle with is like living in the like, I don't know, like busyness being like a, like a social capital kind of like if you're always busy that there, there's something that there's like a weird positivity to that, which I don't love. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I just I really liked that one. And they're all like that. They're all like, very like just funny this one's little totally about anxiety. Uh, is this little bird is like bzz, 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 sleeping, and then it's like scratch, 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 and then oh my god, death, and this kind of panic. Uh, death is coming for me. Uh, oh my god, that's like <laughs> so <move>. relatable. <laughs> yeah. Just bzz, bzz, just trying to sleep, trying to sleep. Okay, wait, I think it's a bug. It stopped. I think that this is about the anxiety of like just trying to sleep and the impending uh, thought of death coming. Just like zzz, little tiny bird. So yeah, that's our first share, Lisa Visser. I love that. I love yeah. also that the bird is lying down like a human being, just like... <laughs> with his little legs. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Who did you want to talk about first? Um, so uh, I think it makes sense. So, so there are, uh, there's an artist um, who's a good friend of mine and who was uh, in my, um, who was a classmate when I was an undergrad. Um, and her name is Alchemia Marsland. And she makes these wonderful, she's um, going into her master's um, in uh, in the States right now, but she makes like, just, she's so, inc such an incredible printmaker, um, like illustrator. She, she makes these uh, uh, laser cut earrings um, about care. And so uh, she gave me one, um, uh, it's called in they're like text space and so one is one part says are you and then in, in letters and then it says okay and so there's like are you okay um I and i have those of course sorry i love that that's like so <laughs> cool yeah i i really love her work and uh, she makes these triangular um pyramidal uh pillows um that are um with letters on this like flocked vel like velvet and um they're all like poetic and and also very strange and her her style and her um sort of range is is very impressive and and i've always kind of uh, loved her work so i i've been i've been asking her for a pillow for for a while now so <laughs> hopefully uh, i can get one no, you um, can trade them for a face mask <laughs> yeah that's what i was thinking i mean i don't know <laughs> if she needs a ballistic one but um and then, uh, yeah, and then if you want to talk about the, the next person, I, oh, I'd love right. to hear it, yeah. So, sorry, we're doing text-heavy stuff right now. Do we want to flip the mm -hmm. camera, Kyle, and show this one? Oh Maybe this one's, like, all text. So this one is more, um, I don't even know if they're still making these, but basically there's a... I'm going to grab that whiteboard. Okay. There's a... Uh, like a designer that goes to a lot of craft shows. Um, he's out of Montreal and his name is Raymond. I think that you say the last name, name like B singer. It's B I E S I N G E R. Um, and he was mostly doing these like really beautiful, um, like maps of different cities. And that's like what, um, like I saw at most of the craft sales that I had like seen his work at, but he also had like kind of off to the side, this like collection, like of little like zine pamphlet mm. type things. Do you want to try and flip and the like, I don't know, like high school. Yeah. The high schooler in me was of course like super drawn to these. I'm just going to flip this around to these like little pamphlets. Hold on. I was like, what is this? My high school self, I wasn't in high school when I um, saw Raymond's work. So he's also in a band that was at the time called The Famines and is now called Pentagon Black, I've learned. And so they had created this like little zine that is called like How to Book a Maybe Successful Tour <laughs> for a band that hasn't received hype on Pitchfork. <laughs> and... 
because Kyle and I have been like making all of these videos on like you know, just talking about the art world, sharing, like, what we've, like, learned and noticed over the past, like, 12 years of running Sparkbox. Um, I thought I would share someone else has, who has, like, also been doing something similar, but just, like, in a different format. And I also kind of love the, like, I don't know, punk rock aesthetic of, like, making, a, like, a how-to guide and, like, a photocopied zine pamphlet that you have a craft sale. Mm -hmm. But it's also super practical. So... I don't really know anything about being in a band or going on tour or trying to plan a tour, but this guide is like really informative. It talks a lot about like, yeah, like the logistics of like driving places, what you actually are going to need, how you should talk to people, what's a beneficial way of reaching out, how to get college radio stations to play your music, all this kind of stuff. And so, um, yeah, I will like take, like better photos of it to post onto our stories. But I, I just like, I like, um, like artists helping artists and trying to like make, make the scene a little bit more accessible and like less confusing by just mm. giving like practical, real, like tried and true tested because they talk a lot about how they've like actually used these practices in building their own tours um mm -hmm. yeah and just like sharing resources i think maybe i paid like a dollar for this probably even less i can't remember it was incredibly affordable um so yeah like, that's our second share i like the the maps on there what are they about i'm pretty sure that they're maps of like the tour routes that they went on so um, in one of the sections, it talks about like planning a tour route and then mm. also like trying to figure out like how to make sure that you're touring during like the most optimal times of the week. And mm -hmm. so they, t it was like, I think one of their tour routes was, um, maybe when they were living on the West coast, they must've been because it was, I'm pretty sure it was like between like Edmonton and Calgary or something like that. And just mm -hmm. talking about like, okay, this is how far you can go in a weekend. And this is how you can make sure that you're like actually hitting up certain spots um, over the course of a few days so that you're not having to like only go to one city for one night. And between that city and the next, you there's no where to really like play a show. Mm -hmm. um, which is not something I would have thought about because I don't know anything about being in a band. And uh, sometimes we talk about how like most of our, you know, we we're visual artists. Most of our like information is for like that scene. Yeah. And but hmm. we've had like musicians and filmmakers and performance artists stay with us. And so trying to find resources to help also talk to that group of people, I think is really important, but we aren't experts in that. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, speaking of people who are sort of sharing and putting back into the community, um, the other artist um, that I, I really want to give a shout out to is uh, uh, Sandeep Johal. And she's a, um, a here in, in Vancouver. And I did a show with her in the same gallery, um, the Barat Art Foundation. And her range is also incredible. She does um, illustrations and collage work and prints, and um, but she also does murals, these incredibly vast, beautiful, um, colorful murals. Um, and she has a solo at the Surrey Art Gallery this this fall. Um, and she uh, just, uh, she did this uh, for the Barard Art Foundation when I was there. She was in residence and she did this incredible series on motherhood and she created these sort of like beast, beastly, um, beings like um and like representational representational figures but they were had like the heads of a wolf or like the, the hands and claws of like a bear or something and and they were sort of cradling or in relationship to like a, a, a like a smaller childlike figure and it was her sort of also reconciling with motherhood and like and the, the fabrics that she used were like sourced uh, um, like from vintage shops and all these all these other different cultural um connected places for her and they were just absolutely stunning and she was sewing to like the day of the opening uh and um 
when speaking to her, she, it just sounded like she had first, um, and I could be wrong about this, but she was kind of intimating that it was sort of new to her, this like textile practice. And I was kind of astonished by this, like her skill and expertise and her way of handling this material. Um, and it just her work is, is so stunning and beautiful. But not only that, but she herself is such a giving and generous person. And anytime there is any sort of um, opportunity for her to give a shout out to somebody or to support a fellow female artist, like she has like our backs and it's, it's just um, very inspiring to see. That's yeah. awesome. That's so mm -hmm. awesome. These works sound really cool. I hope I can find mm -hmm. them on her feet so I can share those as the image. Yeah. That sounds... Sweet. Do you have anybody else that you want to like give out a shout out to? Uh, yes. we only I, always, <laughs> <laughs> I always give a shout out to a, a really good friend of mine who is also a classmate. Um, and I love his work because um, he works primarily with birds and the, um, ideas of birds. And so he has these photographs uh, of birds. And one that I really love is, um, and he just did recently did a show at the Monica Reyes Gallery here, a solo. Um, and it just had this, um, it had the like a music, like a stand for like a, um, uh, like a musical reading stand. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> music statues okay so and then on top of it there are two sort of um curved uh bark pieces of bark that have been cut from a tree like in the round and then kind of cut in half and then placed like a musical sheet and on top of them were all these marks made by this woodpecker and so you have these incredible notations of this this mark of, of this of this woodpecker on top of like this this um this bark that's gently placed on this musical sheet and I just it, it, like his work always blows me away it's so it's so like powerful but gentle and, and forceful and it has all these mixtures in it and his name is Matthew Ballantyne and uh, I always want to give a shout out to him because cool. he's like he's fantastic yeah that sounds really cool yeah, I, yeah. little mm -hmm. woodpecker works I feel like um does he when he like was he watching the birds? Is that how he knew, um, like, what kind of bird it was and that that was definitely the mark from that bird? Like, is he, like, a birder person? Like, yeah, he is definitely. What are those called? <laughs> I don't know the proper term, so I apologize if it's, like, derogatory, but he's definitely a bird watcher, um, and he's, like, he has such a love for, for birds, and he knows them so well, and I, I, I kind of turn to him as, like, an encyclopedia for bird knowledge, um, and he does these, these like, hours of walks, um, like, I think, um, if not daily, like, on the regular, and he goes and watches birds, and it's just, his work is just so, so incredible, yeah. Awesome. Cool. That's super awesome. We should link him up with Jordan. And make I was thinking the yeah. exact same thing. We, <laughs> we have, have a have murder friend. That... He's a printmaker. He's yeah, really he's cool. like also a super sweet and lovely person that makes amazing art and like loves birds and yeah. can point them out and tell you all about them. And yeah. Sounds, sounds like a perfect match. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. this has been such a fun chat. And like, I, I'm really excited to see where, like, this new series of work goes. And, like, I mean, obviously we're going to be in touch a lot over the next little bit to, like, keep informed as to, like, the developments yeah. of all of these things. And, yeah, if anybody wants to do, like, a, a little workshop about um, making different bio substrates for... <laughs> whatever you might want to use them for um shoot us a message and we can put you in touch yeah. sweet thank for you sure. so so much thank you so much for having me this was such a pleasure and it was so so nice to have like a casual conversation yeah Ditto. good uh, i i loved this chat yeah like this is a really wonderful afternoon thank you very much for joining us thank you we'll talk to you soon thanks everyone bye else. everybody here as well Bye. We will see you all next week.